Look at this dude. Sticking out your gut for the Rizzler. Times are hard, with so much strife, so much anguish, and so little to go around. It's easy to lose sight of ourselves swept up in the hurricane. But that's fine by me. I don't mind a challenge, homie. <laughs> you can call me. I wasn't sure what to expect from The Witcher. I mean, I've been avoiding these games. Deliberately. It's a popular series and you know, you know damn well I play Princess Crown in my spare time. I avoided it because of the pro tag, like, yeah. That's exactly what my RuneScape character looked like when I was 10. I avoided it because it's an adaptation, a real novel series crushed and crammed into the video game medium, or at least a fraction of it. And can I trust that to own? Can I trust that as a piece of art? This is a game that introduces the world with the following. Venture through a dark world where there is no good or evil, just choices and their consequences. Bro, I can smell the audience for this game from here. But The Witcher is a great game, a fascinating interpretation of the original material, and definitely worth discussion. But before venturing out, we gotta prep. CD Projekt Red, or a CD Projekt, they're Polish. That's neat. Didn't start as a game dev studio, but as a distribution company making foreign titles available to other regions, translating games to Polish, even working on an eventually canned PC port of Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. And now The Witcher makes more sense. Eventually, and presumably for the sake of survival, the company secured the rights to The Witcher from author Andrzej Sapkowski for a mere 10,000 USD. Because boy howdy art don't pay, pivoted to game dev and got to work on The Witcher using a heavily modified version of Bioware's engine to better suit solo adventuring play. It was a beautiful game, astoundingly buggy, and still has plenty of issues today, even in the enhanced edition. But unlike Geralt of Rivia and your average YouTuber, I guess, I am not a gamer. I don't care about a few glitches. That's the beauty of the medium. Yeah, I said it. And I'm right, too. I don't care if it controls a little weird. Sweetheart. Precious. Darling children, I played classic Armored Core. And Steambot Chronicles. And Too Human, this is Goo Goo Gaga sh uh. And most importantly, I don't care to tell you every plot event in order because the game is greater than its plot points. I know what you're thinking, and you're right. I've got a long way to go before I can cover The Witcher like a real gamer. But maybe, if I can just think a little grayer, a little less rigidly, let my mind free of right and wrong, forget everything. Or I could just bonk myself in the head. The Witcher begins with an amnesiac Geralt. It's a well-worn trope, but it's important. Without it, the player would have been thrown into Game of Thrones without a lexicon, so to speak, lost in a sea of nouns and interpersonal relations, treading water for hours. That can work, but not in every narrative. And when you intro your game with just choices and their consequences, you need to make some room for player expression and murder without consequences. I seriously think Grand Theft Auto has bigger punishments for killing. You meet plenty of characters Geralt knew previously. He's an established person in this universe with a job, jargon, and pretty strong opinions about professional ethics. Goes on a ramble in the first few chapters here, damn. But you don't gotta worry about any of that. You can kill a guard for free, with no ramifications at all. Role-playing Geralt. I'm gaming! I think the intro cutscene sets expectations better than anything else, encapsulates the entire setting, this completely opulent seven-minute episode detailing one of the early scenes from the first novel. We're shown Geralt prepping for a monster encounter, taking potions, stalking, engaging in battle with many kinds of weapons, retreating, and finding a non-lethal means of dealing with the creature. It's fascinating to watch. I mean, what do you think when you see Geralt of Rivia? My bet is Sorty Edge Lordy and with no issues spilling blood, and that's true. He does that in the second scene of the book, immediately after the introductory lay, but it's only true to an extent. Geralt is interesting enough to have his own game, but you might not know it at a glance. This is a man who travels the world slaying monsters or sparing them as the job allows, who's older than most of the regular people he meets, despite his youthful appearance, who tries to mind his professional capacity, at least regarding the lives of monsters, and who does not choose Use violence first, unless it's for some kind of greater good. In a phrase, do you know how much suffering it took to become this gentle? 
That's the compelling thing about Geralt. He is wisdom thoroughly tested. He is the standing stone with a 10 inch cut. But you're not gonna find out about all of that just playing the game, or at least not for a while. Let's check the intro segment. <laughs> You're taught the basic rules of play, wander around in 3D space with a fairly tight FOV, click dudes to attack, and click again with the right timing to combo. It's a primitive system, but demands engagement at a micro level. It's hard to complain about, you know, unless you're a gamer mad that it's not Assassin's Creed. The Witcher forces the player to choose, multiple times, over the course of the game. Morality systems were a hot trend during this era of gaming, but The Witcher's doing something a little different, something approaching meaningful roleplay. Approaching. Many choices aren't immediately win-win. Doing good may cause ill. There's no bar to fill. Horns aren't gonna sprout out your head for being bad. The Witcher as a series is about a browbeaten world so thoroughly coated in scum that any one hero type trying to make a dent will polish a spot, turn to polish another, turn back, and find their work paved over with fresh muck. It's a deeply cynical and murky land penetrated by fleeting rays of something resembling hope. Or at least the game wants to sell that illusion. You can choose between helping your mentor Vesemir or apparent Holy melon salesman shit. Triss. It's a trivial choice that leads to no deaths or permanent consequences. You can power up your sword faster if you help Vesemir. More on choices later. We're tutorialized on combat, magic, choice making, alchemy, and even intercourse. Getting a lot done in the intro, boys, nice. But not all is not lost. Kara Morin was attacked by Salamandra, a rapidly growing bandit group seemingly led by a mage and an assassin. Said assassin manages to kill a trainee witcher before teleporting away, witcher secrets in hand. After a somber moment, establishing that people die unfairly in this universe and that witchers are not gods, just very prepared men, the assembled witchers hit the road and were let loose, alone, in the first real chapter of the game. Finally, I can become a gamer. But first I gotta blast rope to that sunset. The stark contrast between sprawling metropolis shitholes and pastoral windswept moors underlines the entire game. But before getting a taste of modern society, we're stuck in the sticks for a good few hours. There's obvious narrative value in that decision. Show off the people before showing off the society. Start small and build up. Got any giant rats to slay, ma'am? But the contrast between rurality and urbanity is also fundamental to The Witcher as fiction. You learn very quickly that monsters who make their homes away from human civilization are not all as monstrous as they appear, and often simply the consequences of human behavior or just trying to live. Perhaps it is us who are the real monster. And that's the whole point of chapter one. It's a much more solid intro experience than the Karamoran cinematic slow roll. You're dumped at the bus stop all alone in your big boy pants, and now it's time to get witchering. And buddy, you're all out of back, Wano. You run all over this gorgeous outskirts village talking to peasants, learning what you can, taking out local monsters, solving problems, and more or less making yourself useful, as one does, when they've got a quarantine city to slip into and salamandra goons to track. We meet Alvin at the start of this chapter, a little kid who starts speaking in tongues. He's a weird character to meet. You end up guiding him throughout the game, you know, teaching him things. Can we play kill the elf? No, Alvin, racism is bad even if it's about knife-eared bastards and dirt gnomes. Alvin might seem like a weird inclusion. He's really only present in the chapters to create conflict and But he also acts as an opportunity for the player to espouse their values, consider who they are and what they believe. Freed from the game's good and evil drapery, Alvin lets the player see their values made manifest, repeated back to them, even to a small extent. Damn. Maybe this company actually is in the business of rehabilitating gamers. The Witcher can be a bumpy playthrough for plenty of reasons, but one of the first involves side quests. You're a guy with a sword in what is effectively a solo CRPG. You know you're going to be collecting boar asses, but you find out pretty quick that boar asses can't be harvested from boars. X can't be collected from Y unless you've been told about the creature's physiognomy via books or local intel. You must talk to people and read expensive books to become knowledgeable enough to complete fetch quests. Education is the gamer's anathema. This is deranged. Mechanically, it's a basic consequence of Geralt losing his memory. He instinctively knows how to Witcher, like he's a millennial or something. 
I did a thing! He knows Witcher combat, you know, slash slash pirouette like a bara ballerina, but can't remember all the particulars. The player is made to inhabit this Geralt, learn the lore, slot into the role, and all through simple mechanical subtraction. It took me by surprise. Someone who really enjoys Dragon Age, long combat hallways and all, CRPGs can play like this? So you marinate in the setting, naturally inhabit this character, and realize that the world of the Witcher is pretty goddamn terrible. Beautiful or not, the countryside is populated by vile, desperate people with little holding them back from their worst impulses. Forget honor and eternal salvation. Coin is stretched thin, your own as well, by the way, and the first chapter beautifully illustrates a people on the margins. You offer a solution in one hand and a problem in the other. Witchers refuse to work for free, but the monsters gotta go, and these people people are poor. The game makes a point about no good or evil, but what it really means is that these words are irrelevant. When times are hard, when there's no way to climb in a system that operates on capital, when supernatural creatures assail you and bandits roam free, there's no incentive to engage with morality as a construct. It's an ailing society that leads to an ailing populace. At the very least, Geralt's okay receiving goods and services sometimes. You encounter a lot of these people, and like you'd expect from Bumpkins, they get up to some funny antics. One of the earliest choices Geralt is presented with, titled Racists, okay, features a dwarf being harassed by jackasses while Geralt monologues to himself like, To help or not to help. That's the witch's last chance. Counterpoint. A lone civilian is being assaulted by thugs and you're more powerful than any knight. Not a choice. Zoltan is one of Geralt's friends, like before the game. Friends. Like an actual established universe character, you can choose not to help because, well, you have amnesia. You don't know that guy. It might even be difficult carving through those peasants and gee, they seem pretty angry. Maybe they have a good reason to be upset. People like both sides in The Witcher sometimes, like, no good and evil means everything is morally neutral, but mechanically speaking, you're totally unrewarded for failing to help, and are rewarded for intervening, so... Maybe there's a little more to unpack in that whole Witcher morality thing. It's just not this chapter, because it turns out Geralt is an enormous f gamer. Things fall apart, a mob gets whipped up, you can f in a cave. I promise this is art, actually. Be gone, Witcher, and leave the witch, or we'll burn you too. I'd like to see you try, Pleb. Holy gamer! Geralt's had enough of this place. He strolls in, deals with everyone's stupid problems, gets his ass bit by ghost dogs up and down the town, and ends up helping a guy who sells supplies to Salamandra, the guys you're after for raiding Kermorin, assisting the village elder who spouts off pious BS but also enacted a religious cleansing in this very village before you arrived, doing chores for a rapist, and even working with a guy who committed patricide proven by the monster that sprouts from his brother's grave, and who tries to pass the buck to the local witch, the closest thing these idiots have to healthcare. And while there is some doubt about Abigail, who does do some inarguably suspect things like concoct love potions, profiteer off other awful people who she ultimately assists, and potentially belongs to a demonstrably evil cult, she is not alone in sin. The village holy man sold children to Salamandra and plenty of the people you assist are vile. This is another one of them choices where you could feed her to the mob. You could! But then you'd miss out on getting to murder every twisted douchebag who strung you along, like Red Dead Redemption with actual justice. The first chapter hits for plenty of reasons, but the low-level, spooky Hamlet questing coupled with disturbing reveals, drama, intrigue, and a satisfying capstone, even if it's less satisfying on review, sets the tone for the entire series. It's the chapter by which all preceding chapters will be judged. It Son of a Now with old CRPGs, it's fun to take a drink while playing. Witchers traditionally use alcohol as the basis for their potions before mixing in all that weird stuff they found in the fridge. But uh, this actually looks okay. Let's go. Chapter 2 starts in the clink. Like any good Saturday morning, you get out of prison pretty quickly. The guards need a sewer cockatrice slain and you've got the skill. You meet up with the single worst haircut in the game, this guy Siegfried, who helps you kill the monster and declares you a friend. Brothers in arms and all that. The second chapter is a mess. An absolute nightmare tangle you're made to unravel just so over hours. It's one of the most interesting and frustrating segments in any game I've ever played. 
and I'm sure it shunts half the player base to online guides, if only to preserve the correct results. Here look, The Witcher, you'll notice, has a lot of combat, but hardly as much as its CRPG contemporaries. Towns in Dragon Age are hubs that act as minor interludes between combat segments. Combat is most of that original game, but The Witcher is about a compelling character in a compelling position. Strength, reputation, friends, and it takes advantage of that more character-driven play where possible. The Witcher's second chapter is a mystery, one you work alongside a detective to solve, and encompasses more characters and relations than any other part of the game. It's the perfect test of The Witcher's chosen gameplay framework, prioritizing talk, roleplay, the economy of information, above raw combat, numbers, and spectacle, but strains the experience to the breaking point here. You're confined to a single district of the city and allowed to wander to the swamp region accessed via gondola. This confinement is important. Like narratively, Geralt is still finding his feet and tossing him into the city proper. Could be fatal to a witcher that's forgotten his place in the world. It breaks you into the society of Tamaria without throwing you to the wolves, as it were, and keeps you grounded in nature and outskirts problem solving, something already familiar to the player. It also allows the world to unveil itself more thoroughly, peasants to common folk to lords by chapter 3. It's hard to know how meticulously this game was planned, especially with regards to the pre-existing material the novel series, which is pretty heavily tinkered with, but it bespeaks a finely crafted experience, at least from an organizational perspective. The first chapter featured constantly spawning ghost dogs and consistent riverside drowner attacks, but Vizima is slightly better patrolled and only threatens you with night striding assassins and the occasional brawl. The real combat trouble lies in the swamps. It's extremely easy for an unprepared player, ignoring the side quests or fed up with the mystery, to piss off to the swamp to decompress and wind up dead because because the game simply does not care. Geralt was willing to threaten the lives of an entire town, so Geralt can handle himself in the wilderness. Fair enough. Except when a roving boss monster pops up on occasion and cuts you down in seconds, or you're swarmed by too many, too strong monsters. Why? Bumpy progression. Like I said, The Witcher can be trivially easy or incredibly difficult, and it's almost completely related to the amount of investment the player puts into Geralt. That sounds obvious, but many modern games allow players to entirely disengage from their systems and skate by on the bare minimum. I think the devs gambled on the player finding Geralt interesting, because he is, expecting them to get invested in book reading, Witcher contract completing, and money making, all for the sake of upgrades and skill points to more fully kit out their Geralt. It's one of the strengths of the chapter, presenting an immediately challenging combat-focused region and a more RP-focused region to hop between at your leisure, taking your pick and suiting your whims. During your sleuthing and interpersonal times, the eyes never get lost. Bah, bah, bah. Bro, you're eventually forced into a gamer conundrum. God, I hate those so much. In the first chapter, Geralt learns about the Squiatel, or squirrels, elven militants who want to forcefully reclaim their lands, free the wilds from the yoke of human tyranny, and punish the men who drove their people to the margins. This manifests in a lot of low-key terror for the peasants of the outskirts, and even a moment where you can choose to hand them supplies. They're introduced as dangerous, but their cause is sympathetic. In chapter two, you meet the Order of the Flaming Rose, effectively the military branch of the Church of the Eternal fire, once a cult elevated to official faith status via popularity. They're not very subtly visually linked to the Teutonic Knights and Knights Templar of real human history, and they hate non-humans, from dwarves to elves, though they do kill monsters for free, notably lacking the subtlety of the Witcher's trade and moving in on their dying order's territory. Went far enough to show the Witcher's trade being colonized. Incredible work, guys, seriously. A skirmish breaks out in the swamps and you're offered the choice, the only really major choice of the chapter, to assist one of the sides or remain neutral. Consequences for this decision are minor. In fact, the mystery of the chapter has much more impactful outcomes than in this particular battle, but it's worth paying attention to in this moment. The player can stay out of the conflict, and may understandably do so. It's two opposing forces, neither of which you've had significant dealings with, and there's something greater at stake here. Geralt's neutrality. Throughout the second chapter, and even later on, Geralt insists that he doesn't do politics, but is forced into the political ring purely by happenstance. The people he gets involved with have opinions, agendas, they even want Geralt and Geralt's still figuring out who he is. On one hand, this is accurate to the books. Your boy doesn't like getting involved in matters of state or those otherwise outside the realm of Witcherdom. It's part of the Witcher code, respect 
legitimate authority and operate within the rules of the host land. That doesn't stop him from breaking the code seemingly on a whim in the introduction of the first novel where he kills a few low-life aggressive thugs, presumably to catch the king's attention. Though Geralt is also shown being committed to professional ethics in the following section, through a long-winded exchange with the king. Killing a few men, arguably in self-defense, goes against the first rule. A witcher has no reason to be cruel and no need to prove his strength. Courtesy distinguishes a man from an animal and reveals one's true strength. So a layer of plausible deniability exists. The devs offering a neutral path isn't necessarily appealing to enlightened centrist gamers, but arguably engaging with the source material to an extent. If the guys want to kill each other and involve no one, so be it. A witcher is not a steward of the land. Of course, ignoring the battle means no XP, meaning you're mechanically incentivized to act. Just something to think about. The conflict between the Order and the Squatel is effectively the central conflict. Geralt is figuring out who he is and tracking down Salamandra, but they're a small part of a much bigger picture involving clashing factions. Regardless, the central conflict is still fairly distant, not fully materialized yet, and the more pressing drama involves hunting down Salamandra vigilante style. The investigation, an autopsy, a weird golem kiting quest, all of which leads to opening an old tower and Oh, it's gamer time. It's gamer time. Turns out the investigator was the bad guy all along. <laughs> That'll teach you to mess with a gamer. The real detective was killed off screen and replaced by the mage from the raid on Kaer Morin, Azar Javed. This culminates in a short battle, which is capped off by the single most infamous scene in the game. As are you fool. Let the witcher get the better of you. You nearly got me killed. Silence. Back to the base of the trade quarter. Hurry before he recovers. We shall meet again, freak. Guys, Geralt was on the ground. He was right there. No? No, I must calm myself and remember that play is an abstraction, that I can't make assumptions about the intent because game dev is hard, and maybe he was worth more alive. He was right there! Medallion's humming. It only hums near danger. Something is coming. Ah yes, sex with a woman, one of life's three joys. The way The Witcher is constructed and divided into five major chapters is important. Not every game is delivered like this. The easy comparison is Dragon Age, which is subdivided, the world state progresses over the course of the game, but that includes the world outside wherever the player is at any point. But not many games spin such a convincing narrative with their construction. If the first chapter was Geralt preparing to enter the world again, and chapter two was Geralt finding his footing in the world, but with safe ties to nature regardless, chapter three is the culmination of these efforts, fully entering the place he's least comfortable, surrounded by uncouth, slack-jawed people with no real kindness for witchers, lying as easily as they breathe, draped in schemes. One of the tenets of the witcher's code involves honesty, straightforwardness, and it's partly why witchers struggle with polite society. It's spun up from rules and rituals of no real substance. It is the opposite of truth. Indeed, perhaps it is men who are the real monsters. We live in a society. Consider that you're often prompted to drink with a character to get the truth out of them. It happens a few times, and while it's true that people have secrets, it's a pretty straightforward mechanical admission that, yeah, in this world, being genuine, forthcoming, etc., is either rare or dangerous. That's the real thrill of the segment. After being shown the evils of the ignorant masses and the danger of beasts, you're finally allowed to hunt Salamandra almost exclusively, and served alongside that specifically human combat, you're also made to navigate those who Geralt dislikes most. Schemers, liars, politicians, two kinds of combat. The first major quest involves putting on the clothes of the upper crust and mingling with them. It's a fun bit of gameplay, talking with various nobles, learning more about the world outside of just the backwaters. It makes you realize how trivial, in the bigger picture, all that work really was. Witchers aren't heroes, per se, and not in the Geralt is the ultimate anti-hero way. I mean that witchers are workers, skilled labor, and that puts you at odds with anyone who doesn't immediately find you useful, dangerous, capable of magic. Witchers are a combination of the things common people hate about mercenaries and witches. What are you waiting for? Your Highness. I shall answer in due course. But first, I must know if those legends about your sword are true. 
as you command. Geralt, you filthy boy. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of politicking, Geralt does a good chunk of murder in this chapter, ending the lives of various Salamandra stooges and uprooting their bases. It's hard to take the total murder count literally. Geralt may be a killer, but play is still an abstraction, okay? His body count isn't that high, even if his other body count is. And by this point, the player's probably a little more proficient at killing than when they started, realizing that you can incorporate dodging into play, even if it doesn't really matter that much, that you can make use of magic in combat to trivialize otherwise challenging battles. The first spell is a crowd control ability that lets you execute enemies for free. You might think that makes it the best, but due to combat's particular quirks and Geralt's grounded mobility, the fire spell ends up significantly stronger than you might expect, effectively allowing Geralt to kite enemies around arenas while they burn to death. It's not the most Witcher accurate way to play, but it is funny. <laughs> The others can be majorly or minorly useful depending on the player. Trap, a shield, and a charm. The signs are meant to be used occasionally. They're utility spells. Geralt isn't supposed to be a spellcaster, so his casting abilities are limited. Instead, the bulk of what the player does is wrapped up in swords. You might have a bonus weapon, a dagger, or an axe or something, but Geralt isn't trained in the use of common weapons, so most aren't worth your time. Unless you find a big ol' weapon out in the wild with 30% bonus damage tacked on. Instead, he wields steel and silver swords for human and monstrous enemies, respectively. Both kinds of swords have the same three stances, basically heavy, quick, and crowd control, meant to address those kinds of combat situations. But these stances, shared across sword types, differ in animations and timing, meaning you need to learn the rhythm of six total stances to truly master swordplay. The Witcher is an interesting game to me, who's played so many games now, because it takes on the burden of handling pre-existing material and adapting it to the video game medium, and in doing so, ignores so many traditions and expectations while also clearly preserving facets of them. I'll give you an example of this. In your average CRPG, you might be expected to select a character class or a specialization, but Geralt can't be anything other than Witcher, because that's the game, so it gives you the option, by limiting skill points mostly, of specking into different facets of Witcherdom and deciding what kind of Geralt your Geralt is. My Geralt does a lot of fire damage, but also sword damage. Whoa! Utility. You're dead, idiot! Combat isn't about sequencing abilities, it's about timing your clicks and taking advantage of brief windows created by utility options, making it almost totally unique among 3D CRPGs. Yes, the mechanics are fiddly and weird and kind of bad, but chug a health potion and you'll pull through. By the end of the game, you'll probably be worn out from all the killing. A combat style this repetitive and low scope, no matter how many enemies you fight, can't really evolve into anything super interesting without adding new elements. Bosses might deal a lot of damage or knock you over, but they're not going to demand a high level of dexterity regardless of your timed clicking. The Witcher isn't really all about combat anyway. Not every possible encounter is an encounter. You still collect XP from non-combat quests, and as previously mentioned, you can spare some monsters. Chapter 3 is a few major plot decisions to make, but I want to highlight three. The town is beset by werewolf attacks, only it appears to be killing criminals. When you ask the guard captain about this, he won't say much, except stuff like, okay, so he's the werewolf. Imagine being eight years old, playing this M-rated game, and spoon-fed by the devs with the little airplane. Here comes the answer. I think even an eight-year-old would be offended. I'm not a kid anymore. You are a, you are a child. I'm not. I'm a gamer. You confront the werewolf and you can choose to let him go, ignoring his vigilante justice, kill him, or cure him, ignoring the relative morality of this decision. It's possible to miss your window to cure the guy at all, and then you're really only left with two choices. Sparing him nets you an ally later on, and killing him gets you less experience than you get curing him and completing the quest. So what do these outcomes tell us? First, that taking the lazy and violent route, not curing and then killing, is a solution, but it's not rewarded. You end up with another obnoxious fight afterwards as well, thanks to a Salamandra informant, so it's not even particularly fun to do. You could argue that vigilante justice is unacceptable, but the game paints such an ugly picture of the streets earlier in the game, with sex workers being openly attacked, it almost feels justified letting them walk. 
And I mean, Geralt does it all the time. Allowing him to continue doing as he does can be very rewarding, especially if you manage to finish the associated quest immediately afterwards and makes another combat easier. Allowing vigilante justice doesn't sit super well with me, especially with a guard captain, but the Witcher, like as a series, isn't necessarily concerned with the educate and rehabilitate the masses by enfranchising them deal. Geralt doesn't do politics, but it's also directly treated as heroic, unironically dropping the maybe people are the real monsters. Maybe I should have killed this guy just for that sh oh. The game wants you, just going by mechanics and narrative impact, to cure the guy. You get a pile of XP, you save his life and lives of petty criminals who might be killed erroneously, and help foster the relationship between the werewolf and Carmen, who asks you to cure him in the first place. It's the most constructive outcome, narratively speaking. I like The Witcher not for prescribing outcomes. It might incentivize this or that choice numerically, but it also acknowledges that not everything is worth the time investment or the care, and leaves it to interest interested players to find the most satisfying solutions. It's galvanizing, I guess, getting players wrapped up in their decision making. And it's probably the right call, at least for content that's secondary to the central conflict. But like I mentioned, combat isn't the only type of play on offer. One of the major choices of Chapter 3 involves Triss and determines how Geralt's love life pans out, as well as how Alvin develops. <laughs> yeah, remember Alvin? He's still here, just bipping and bopping around the plot. Hope he's not pivotal to the entire story. You're made to entrust Alvin to Triss, a sorceress who's set up to be your lover, but also untrustworthy. Don't overdo it. Geralt can be exceptionally perceptive. I know. Or Shani, a medic who cared for Alvin up until this point. I didn't trust Triss, but I also thought she was right. Someone with magical experience would be the better person to watch over a child who can't control his innate magic, because in case you don't know, magic can be unbelievably powerful in this setting, uncontrolled. It's a tough choice, mostly because you get an earful either way. How could you? She cast a spell on you! Out of my sight! I will forget your very name! That wasn't fun at all. I'm not even halfway there yet. I'm so bummed. Being a gamer is hard work. I mean, listening to other people's perspectives? Thinking through my choices? Why do I even bother? I'm always right. I don't need to introspect at all. And I definitely don't need to take sides. The Scoia'tael are robbing the bank! Okay, yeah, really funny game. All through the first three chapters, I've been telling people I don't do politics. I don't take sides. I don't get involved. Picture this. I do not want to get involved. And people keep yapping back. Ooh, you're already in it, Geralt. You're gonna have to make a choice eventually, Geralt. Ooh, why? Why should I? I already pay taxes. Don't make me do stuff! The Witcher smartly makes the player choose between helping the Order wipe out the Squayatel who are robbing a bank, or helping the Squayatel make their getaway. This is important for, obviously, forcing the player to make a choice, actively removing the neutral path option that exists both before and after this point in various major decisions, and specifically to make the player confront what they think is acceptable. The Order is demonstrably racist, but legally justified here. They want you to kill the elves, or rather, the non-humans in the bank for breaking the law, taking hostages, etc. Maybe extreme, but I can see some players agreeing with the punitive path if they discovered any of Squayatel's crimes earlier, like killing one of your leads during Chapter 2, or leaving humans to die in the graveyard. Helping the elves helps more people live, however. You fight off some bugs, but otherwise let the elves escape. A bank loses some money. Whatever. This has been bubbling for a while now, so I'm just gonna get to it. The rest of Chapter 3 doesn't matter. You clean up some Salamandra bandits, you face off with the Professor, manage to kill him off, and have to break a bunch of support pillars to squash a giant bug. Right at the end, Ada, who you deflowered on request, attempts to have you arrested, and Triss manages to port you away. It's climactic, dramatic, and caps off the chapter well enough. But, some of you are probably wondering about the title. The Gamer. My constant bullshit about gamers and how I imagine they're interacting with the game. It's probably getting pretty annoying. Except it's not my imagination. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I got a bone to pick with some Witcher fans. Not all. Not the people who play the game and enjoy the ride and appreciate what Geralt's about and how he connects with nature and isn't just the Punisher in a fantastical medieval Europe analog. No, it's the people who go on forums and write shit like this. What is the best good choice, Order or Squirtel? Is this like right versus left? Because I hate communists. 
on my first play, I choose to order, but just because I like Siegfried, I hate order. Otherwise, second, I go Witcher Path, which is good. Didn't play third, so don't know Skoy, guys. P.S. I hate communists, too. Then I must do it all three endings and find for myself what is the ultimate less evil ending. Whoa! Communism only brings war and hungry. Hitler himself has said that he learned a lot from Karl Marx. <laughs> For me, the two sides can be broken down like this. Order, fight fair and honorably, but for a racist cause. Squirrels, fight dirty and dishonorably, but for a just cause. I honestly liked a lot of the Flaming Roses because of the symbol. And because I liked Siegfried, he is friendly and pleasant. Why? Because you're not human yourself. I should have seen your true face and killed you when I had the chance. The squirrels are evil too. They plunder the villages, cities, and kill innocents for a lost cause. If they became unaggressive and more diplomatic, maybe the order wouldn't be so rude with them. I just can't imagine myself siding with these brutal savages. Holy f The Witcher is complicated because life is complicated. Knowing what's right who to side with can be frustrating, especially acknowledging that of course, no side, no one has all the answers. All choices have consequences, but that kind of thinking only serves to chill conversation and problem solving. And The Witcher, the game, wants us engaged, even if it offers an easy out with its frequent neutral path offerings. The neutral path is not rewarded as significantly as taking sides. Like I said, game wants you engaged. People wouldn't be screaming at you to pull the palisade out of your ass and pick a side all game otherwise. People seem to think that Geralt would always act neutrally per the books, but what he really does is try to be constructive with outcomes. He does not hate the world, recognizes his power, and tries to do what he can. The common line is that Geralt chooses the lesser of two evils, both in game and in the novels, and that's mostly accurate. The idea is that everything and everyone is bad in some way or will cause a problem for somebody else, and so harm reduction is ideal, which is an okay way to think about things. I think it unfortunately manifests in some fans as a sort of enlightened centrist mentality where people try to hash out the moral calculus behind supporting any given side. Neutrality is worth nothing in itself and sometimes causes is the death or harm of innocence, and yet part of the Witcher's code involves acknowledging that, yes, with great power comes great responsibility. Inaction is embarrassing. Apathy is death. Siding with the Squayatel often means some human deaths go unpunished and any actual progress toward their cause is scant and fleeting in your lifetime. Siding with the Order means some non-human heads roll and you're additionally furthering the reach and influence of a fanatical religious order. The problem is, now a ton of players are conflating either side with evil. There are bad people on both teams, so the superior intellectual choice is simply staying neutral or even siding with the Order because, well, Geralt may be a mutant, but he's still fundamentally human. So that's his team. Why shouldn't you support them? There is some question of whether or not the problem is solvable. People continuously conflate both major groups of elves, the more naturalist Ein Shi and the more colonial Ein El, and it muddies conversation. Uh, but then you realize some mediocre white guy is trying to meaningfully assess the mores and values of a fictional race of people and further realize that's how everyone treats indigenous populations in the real world. When you break the two sides down, the situation becomes a lot more sympathetic towards the elves. The Order of the Flaming Rose's mascot, Siegfried, starts as a friend who helps you slay a monster, but calling him a friend politely sweeps his enormous bigotry under the rug, kind of like Waka in Final Fantasy X, except Waka has a character arc and moves past those beliefs. You claim to protect humans, yet you've thrown them to the beast. Why? Because you're not human yourself. I should have seen your true face and killed you when I had the chance. Siegfried is part of the Holy Order, which, on the whole, is a racist fanatical religious organization that slays monsters for free, but also displaces, terrorizes, and otherwise destabilizes life for non-humans regardless of their threat level or squatel ties. They are demonstrably evil. They make the lives of those different than them hell for no meaningful reason. They are human supremacists. Their leader, Jacques de Aldersberg, has no issues wiping out not just the Squayatel, 
but all non-humans in general. While not everyone in his order believes in those ideals, because yeah, not every Catholic priest is a pedophile for example, their work still furthers a bigoted cause with ultimately genocidal intentions. They're based on crusaders, the folks who marched into the Middle East in the name of spreading their faith by force. You are not meant to trust them. The thing people get caught on is conflating the evils of the Squatel with the evils of the Order. One of the things I'm disappointed by in current Witcher coverage is the interest I've seen in discussing the historical parallels between the creatures in the Witcher and the fairy tales they're drawn from, but a shocking lack of time devoted to drawing parallels between the Witcher and real-life racial conflicts, which it's so obviously doing, it kind of hurts having to mention. But just in case, let's lynch an elf. Yes. The Squatel, the one radical militant organization of mostly young elves who want to reclaim their ancestral lands, do seek vengeance against the people who displaced them and do cause harm. But why is that? How did this happen? Well, per the books and history I pieced together, all the races came from different worlds, as it were, and the elves came before the humans. They did colonize the world, including waging war against lizard folk and fighting the dwarves, established themselves, and then the humans came. The elves thought the humans were not a threat and consistently retreated and retreated and allowed themselves to be backed into a corner by an incredibly industrious and rapidly colonizing race. Both were colonizers at one point, but humans were the most effective, dominating the world with sheer might, rapidity, and innovation. The elves we see in the Witcher games, not just the Squayatel, are a species long since cowed and made submissive or at the very least made to hide away in their two puny controlled territories while everything, everything their empire once was, is paved over by seas of roving barbarians. They're treated like garbage in human society and quickly being phased out by the time Geralt is born. So when I sit here and tell you this is actually really easy, I hope you understand what I'm saying. When blood's been spilled on both sides, but the elves, under the threat of colonialism by humans, did not massively resist and instead tried to choose the safer, neutral, passive route by walking away, only to be beaten, bloodied, and burned, and some chuckleful on a forum goes, Yeah, well, Squatel, the one militant organization of elves created to reclaim their lands, burned a village one time. All after Geralt unironically threatens to slaughter a village's residents one by one if they harm the local witch, it's really f hard to take these stupid moral calculus posts seriously. This isn't about how many or where or who got hurt, but zooming out to the macro view of the societies in conflict and earnestly acknowledging that flattening the power dynamic at play to both did bad is entirely f infantilistic when one species, not group of people, species is massively weaker in this timeline, in all resources, and facing existential annihilation, and the other is facing some well-earned resistance. To side with the Order is to side with Christo-fascism, with colonialism, and with groundless bigotry. To side with the Elves is to side with preservation, the future, and understanding, at the bare minimum. And no amount of Thermian arguments, defending against critique of a setting by justifying the setting with its own rules, no amount of, but the Elves did this and think that, will ever elevate the objection past intellectually based posturing. The power dynamic is unbalanced, the order is the wrong side. Genocide. Town's called Murky Waters, just like the morality of this video game. Lakeside is so necessary. Chapter 4 starts with Geralt freshly ported to the side of a lake, a quaint, slow-moving backwater replete with field spirits, water people, and peasants. Removed from the political tension and climactic combat, The Witcher presents a microcosm of its universe's beauty, the closest thing to paradise in-game. That's not to say problems don't exist, that people aren't pernicious and cruel or conflict-free. Gaming lurks in us all. But the stakes are allowed to lull and settle. The player is allowed to reconnect with nature after a chapter largely stranded in a metropolitan swamp. The chapter has its dark bits, but it's warmer than the others. Cat riding gnomes, romance, poetry, a lady in the lake right out of Arthurian myth, Cthulhu mythos references, but less insanity inducing. There's a gambling ghost and an annoying British kid. Oh, then Julian yearns for Alina, Selina yearns for Julian, and Alina likes Julian's gold. It's almost farcical. 
but it's got more value than you'd expect. The Witcher, more than the Netflix series lets on, is about nature, connecting with nature. It's romantic in that sense. The wilds are dangerous, rife with supernatural experiences, but you can find healing there as well. Geralt isn't even human, at least according to the humans he meets. He's lumped in with non-humans like elves and dwarves, beings that end up effectively othered by the colonial humans because he's a mutant, and thus treated like a monster, both via his association with monsters, but also his his seemingly superhuman abilities, how he's a brutally efficient killing machine, how his pupils are cat-like, how he accesses strange abilities through esoteric means and uses alcohol, man's best friend, to brew his potions. Geralt doesn't fit in with regular men and constantly seeks a place of belonging. He clings to his order, to the Witcher Code, his job, which means being out in nature, hunting or otherwise dealing with creatures. Nature is a place for Geralt to find himself, carve out his own path in trodden blades of grass. That's the value of Lakeside, meaningfully role-playing as a witcher, Geralt. You even get to hang out and get high with dandelion for hours, screw around getting into trouble, just like the books. At the very least, even if you're an old-school witcher fan and don't agree, I think it shines brighter than any other segment. A lot of different people live in this area, not peacefully, but the stakes are lower. Vaginoi are becoming a nuisance, spirits haunt the fields, but the main quest chain, the one you spend time with dandelion solving, is slightly elevated sister drama. One sister is betrothed to a wealthy merchant, uh, the other gets jealous, pushes the girl to her accidental and untimely death, and after that it's a matter of putting the spirits to rest. It's a sad little side story, if only because you get to watch the realization and regret play out in real time. And helping Dandelion out with some truly sh huh. poetry is basically peak Witcher whimsy. Ghost. Return to the world, but detained by death. Who is this man? A ghost. Stop! Every chapter has a lot of moving parts. Elves are camped out near the lake and want bread. Easy enough? Anything else worth mentioning nearby, or is it just the bread? Now I'm angry. You speak of anger. You, I- Calm down. I don't even know what I did to earn that. Sex in The Witcher is fascinating. On one hand, like with Vanillaware's frequent depictions of women with enormous breasts, The Witcher's been criticized pretty pointedly for including so much sex in its media. That kind of rhetoric only got stronger with the Game of Thrones HBO series. It was THE topic, and The Witcher's been around all through that kind of discourse, with the second game released in the same year. But removed from that context and acknowledging that sex can be an important way to demonstrate an emotional bond in its depths, it also makes perfect sense for this kind of character. I mean, people like Geralt because he's everything they wish they were. Tall, built, not ugly, powerful, and desirable. The complete package with a 10-inch cut. As a witcher, Geralt is infertile and is immune to disease, which means in a time of war, strife, poverty, famine, etc., one of the few dudes with everything necessary for a quick stress-relieving trip to pound town and inbuilt baby protection makes Geralt the obvious choice for any sex enjoyer to throw themselves at. And they do all the time. You get painterly cards for unlocking any particular fling, and you can't even get them all in a run thanks to the Shawnee Triss divide. So yeah, it's a little bit tacky and a little bit barren, and definitely isn't used to demonstrate connection with even a fraction of these people, but is realistic and makes for some of the funniest moments in the game. You think I... unbelievable. You think I would... in these circumstances? The fate of the world is in the balance, and you're thinking about sex? Oh, what the hell. Strip. Other than plowing random women, the spirit of playfulness the Witcher series emanates is on full display here. It's true that the bulk of the supernatural creatures present aren't Witcher originals, but rather European mythological mishmash, and the Lady of the Lake is the perfect example. This is a character from Arthurian legend. Why is she here? As it turns out, she's the compromise path if you choose to side with neither the humans nor the Vaginoi, which makes sense for this particular area. The Vaginoi have claimed to the seas, arguably the land, but the humans are just settlers, not particularly warrior-like or well-armed, and mostly just farm or craft things. They should be hanging out and smoking trees. Most conflicts passively push a mature approach. Picking the Vaginoi might be radical reclamation of the land, but they're fine in the seas, and it'd come at the cost of peasant blood, something Geralt 
doesn't mind spilling, but only when actively justified. The compromise route even involves killing Dagon. Like Dagon. Dagon. This kind of mythological pastiche is annoying at a glance. It's weird to me to not present some kind of unified vision of the setting all the time, to deliberately choose to pilfer instead of brand, and I think the game gets away with it by placing it in this specific chapter. Fighting Dagon from f***ing Innsmouth, I guess, is not the same as it would be in the Cthulhu mythos. It's lifted, but altered. The Witcher's Dagon. And so, he doesn't induce insanity, but is invulnerable to attacks, and is only killed by killing 14 of his worshippers which summon throughout the battle while you kite him around. That's actually kind of brilliant, killing a minor god by reducing the total amount of faith in him in the world. And that's what I mean when I tell you the Witcher is good. Alvin's story is more or less wrapped by this chapter, almost anyway. You guide him pretty directly as he follows you throughout the fields during a few quests, and eventually loses control of his powers, teleporting away somewhere. It's an odd end to his quest, or seems odd at a glance, but I promise it'll make sense in chapter 5. Maybe. Berengar is the only Witcher you encounter outside of Kaer Morhen, and he's holed up in this backwater having run during a battle, making him a coward and a disgrace to the Witcher's code. You can either reassure or rebuke him, but in the end, I chose to act kindly towards the guy if only because it felt appropriate for the Geralt I was playing. Yapping up and down about personal failures, even outright killing him, seems like an insane way to deal with the guy with so few extant Witchers and so little charitability in the approach. What, make one mistake and die for it? That's crazy! Saving him makes him turn up for a boss fight later to redeem himself. Like every preceding chapter, its placement is key to the narrative, because it's here at Lakeside, mostly removed from the central conflict, that Geralt is made to accept that he can't flaccidly both sides the issue, that he can't escape them by prancing around the lake. Regardless of who you sided with in Chapter 3, the Order arrives at Lakeside, ready to hunt any Squatel insurgents. At this point, I helped the Elves, so the Order path became inaccessible. In Chapter 3 you chose, in Chapter 4 you've made your bed. I fought off the Order and exchanged a few words with their leader, but the reason this clash is brilliant isn't about the events, but the location. Nature is where Geralt is comfortable, where he goes to find himself, and all the way out in the sticks, middle of nowhere, the conflict he was teleported away from wormed its way back into his day-to-day. -day. With his last bastion of peace threatened, he has no choice but to take action. With Dandelion in tow, Geralt heads back to face his choices head-on. The final chapter is a fiery conclusion to the quest, featuring a seemingly last-minute villain, an unlikely tie-in, and an all-out war in the streets depending on your choices. If the player sides with no group, he's faced by both elves and crusaders together. If you do pick a side, you're faced by the opposing faction, simple as. In my case, having sided with the elves, the Order decided to go on a killing spree after some elves defended themselves from unjustified aggression. The chapter, in true Witcher fashion, mixes both urban and rural locales and has the unfortunate job of wrapping up an incredibly ambitious and meandering plot. As our Javed still lives, the king wants you to save his daughter Ada, basically recreating the intro cutscene, and the true villain has yet to reveal himself. You don't do a pile of side questing here. Side quests in The Witcher are fantastic for integrating themselves naturally and meaningfully into the actual proceedings of any given chapter, but here you're pretty straightforwardly strung along. First through the streets, naturally fighting off murderers order members who even go after a hospital and Shani because we could be Squatel insurgents, charming folk the order, and find ourselves in a nearby wetland to handle the Striga or Ada. The discerning player, having watched the cutscene and read the quest text, knows they merely have to survive an amount of time to uncurse Ada. But I'd understand if the player put her down anyhow. She demanded to bed you tried to destroy you and ultimately lost control of herself due to her bestial urges. However, the ultimate power move is letting her live, naturally. And well, gamer might be a tarnished word these days, but that's the example I'll set going forward. I will be the gamer, the eternal challenger. You're eventually made to hunt down Azar Javed, fight through his many, many minions, including this giant bug. What is it with these bugs? And finally fail. And fail. I am gonna cut 
maybe death is preferable to being alive. Ada, Azar Javed, the riot in the streets, these are all necessary to wrap, but happen so rapid fire with such little weight, it's kind of a shame. You get the sense, playing the game up to this point and checking off the events one by one, that The Witcher 1 could have easily been a much longer game, but needed to fit within a sane dev cycle, and that's fine. Every game has some kind of quirk or issue, except for Resident Evil 4, and the story leading to the final chapter is great, if only for selling the Witcher experience in the medium of video games. It's important that the Striga was placed here. Without her, there'd be little actual witchering in the final chapter. Dealing with a deranged, experiment-driven mage is slightly outside the job description, even if his creations aren't. The riot is definitely not a witcher's work, but he's been roped into it and made to handle the consequences. After all these points wrap, we're left with the final reveal. Spoilers. The actual villain of the story is Jacques de Aldersberg, someone who, with his full plan revealed, would easily be considered a radical amongst his own followers. Jacques has a vision of the future and wants to wipe out non-humans and prepare mankind for a coming ice age by moving them southward. Not exactly clear why the southward march requires destroying non-humans. They're mostly to the north and east if I got my map marked correctly. Maybe it's just for fun. Just a casual little genocide for complete human saturation on the continent. Sure, whatever. Geralt tells him off and the fight begins. You're made to walk through a long corridor segment facing enemies and reflections of characters you've met throughout the game and finally face off at the summit. It's pretty easy to mentally check out at the finale, realizing that the game decides to supersede its own central tension with a climax that feels kind of like an ass pull, but at least cements, without question, that the leader of the Order was ultimately open to genocide to save his own people. And while things might have panned out different with another guy at the head of the Order, that isn't how the dice fell. It's long, arduous, really straining credulity by the end, but also manages to emblemize the weight of choice and action. You're allowed to be neutral for most of the game, but here, faced with all of your decisions, all your friends, enemies, and acquaintances, and a final definitive challenge, you get the sense that you did make a difference in the world, that you can make a positive change for everyone's sake. And while it's gonna be about as fun as tearing that fence post out your rectum, it's still possible. It is to embrace the challenger and reject the gamer. A fine capstone. Only, there's the matter of Alvin. So, double spoiler, Alvin is Jacques de Aldersberg, who managed to fall forward or back or some ways through time and coexist in the same continuity because people mention this guy in chapter two. And yes, they have different names and different hair, but Jacques quotes things you've said to Alvin back at you. Like his dialogue to Geralt reflexively alters based on your ways of speaking to Alvin. And it's confirmed later in the series. Jacques is a racist. Alvin likes to play kill the elf, etc. I'm not sure what to make of this, except I know it's not in the books. It's an insane premise, and based on my previous conclusions about Alvin, that he exists to parrot your thoughts on his behavior about how people should act, back at you implies that Jacques is a final means to undermine the player's confidence in themselves, and we could uncharitably read that as some kind of cheap, enlightened centrism. But I think the fact that you're ultimately made to rebuke him, confirm your convictions, and put him down now that he's at the risk of harming himself and others, takes Alvin's role to the most extreme endpoint possible. Seeing what he's become, grappling with your true self, your role in this development, and making the hard choice to act as a father figure one last time. It's more powerful written than how it feels to play through. The entire sequence is absurd. So is The Witcher, really, with its pastiche creatures and sex and boozing, incredibly twisted, contemptible people in mud huts sat alongside stark naked dryads and tranquil thickets. It contains multitudes. So many multitudes, it even has a sequel. Hey, it's Kbash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are Adam Welch, Acropolis, All the Singularity, Alpha 42, Andrew Redacted, Arch, Arshwasser, Azura, Axon 8, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bosch 7, Ben M, Beguile, Big Papa Sprung, Bing Bing Doo Doo Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Hargle Blossom Dante, Boha, Boom Dead, BH Operator, Born in Shadow, Brandon S, Brandon Hesse, British Gooch, Cow, Kixar, Can I Cuss on Here, C Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Hero Hero, Cordon, Chris Bromo, 
Cody Gold, Comfy Moogle, Couch Mobile, Crash Curse, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glassworks, Cynical, Denny Pango, Dakota Storm Jones, Jones Stag, Swag, David Bay, Castillo, Dara, Deco, Deadwood, Dead, Dennis Amaya, Destrega, Diablo, Dingus Bat, Doodle Flu, Doug Prince, DJ, Professor K, Dr. Cullen, PhD, The Protagonist, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Thug, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Emperor Pickle, Empty Tenshi, Eric Monticello, Aesthetico, Everstone Isle, Nar, Fail Knight, Forte Noir, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Frog Vormis, Gato Nero, Gigglebutt, Glyphseeker, Nine Cat, Dobo Bobo, Goose 6112, Great, The Darkest Black, Gucci Gucci Plant, Asi Ibrahim Tanyurga, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Arkosh, Demon, Game and Station, Hermit J, Hex Max, Honey Mutt, Horn Tiger, How do you know? Huey, I just took seven grams of magic mushrooms and now I'm lost in the woods. I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer. Inferno Galore. Ingenious Cloud. IOBG. I punched a sandwich. Irrational. Irradiated Cherry. Dice Kyle. It's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not Why? good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jack Hydra. Jacob. James. Jason Lasky. Jaden. JL Savarus. J. Day. JK Hedgehog. John Bo the Joker. Joke Frog. Jordan Joyner. Jorzy Burden. Juicy Frost. Jules DLC. Julian My Julian. June. Kai Zeta Slow. K Bash's Best K. Keegan Too Cool. Keith the Thief. Kata Snap. King Kuma. Keith. Can I Pike? Clock. K Noe. Kong 2020. Crazy. Crazy. Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Kite. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Lady Dentalian. Lady Weed. Blake Tricks. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Lethal Nibbles. Linkle. Little Big Trouble. Loathsome Dung Eater. Low Fat Fadmoger. Lucas Boy. Lucky McSmug. Mac James. Lunatic. Loopin the Turd. Magic Meow. Magical Mad Man. Mama Rollin. Mana Pool. Mara Gang. Mercules. Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Niver. Maple Puppet. Metal Gear Gash. Michelle Citrano. Mike DeVere. Mickey Mo Official. Mikusagi. Moa. Bobby Dobby. Big Titty Gop GF Cooley. Monochrome only. Morgana Black. Modi. Mr. Dodongo. Mr. Whiskey 282. Mr. Yeedy Dabface McYoinkbomb. Nyra New. Nito Torpedo. Nico Puzzle Rack. Nifty Rex. Nori and Deridius. Not Nobel. Nuggy. Old Burgle. Old Man Cranberry. Omega Fighter. Omni Nerd Zero. Omni LK. Kaplant. PBK. Pandemic Cowboy. Pelagic Undulation. PK Gaming. He Mike. Popular Hitman. Potato Gaming HD. Prismatic Dan. Pringle Prongle. Pringle Prongle. Probably not Grady. Fractal and Pals. Project Dark Light. Punch Fighter Champion. Quasar McDougal. Quillwork. Quinn. Rad Punk. Raging Ataraxia. Reggie Rodriguez. Renteca Bond. Ricochet Frame. Rain Relay. Roy Londo. RP Gamer. Ryan Mattel. Ryan Maury Brooks. Psycon Man. Siren Smells Good. Salsa. Salty Smash. Scribe Slendy. Say Say. Sakai No Awarda. Sephirium. Sexy Bionicle GS. Shinigami. Shintendo. Shut Up Wesley. Silver Bear 909. Singe. Sir Doodles a lot. Sim. God. Sleepy Wabbit. Snars. Tozetta Dan. Sockum Bopper. Suckdologer. Space Lizard. Squidget. Squishward. Star Knight Sky. Storm Strider and the House of Storm. Streffin Battle. Super Dingus. Super Sandwich Guy. Taya Toxin. George Chubbington. Terrence Swift. The Big Buddy. The Clown Prince of Cringe. The Digital Dutchman. The Good Lord has blessed me. Hallelujah. The Green Loki. The Crispy Boy. The Peacemaker Pyro. The Salt Knight. The Nomad. The Real McCoy. Big Dick Mystic. Fresh. Rips Heart. Tickles McGuff. Tim Lobster, Tim the Writer, Tony Jones, The Legend, Total Play, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, Ty Guy 9001, Vid, Vacant Plaza, Valen Red, Venom, Vice Pop, Vic, Walk in, get bright in my bag, Poza, We are so K back, Weed Trash, Waylon, Where am I? Widgy, Winter Soul, Wood TV, Wrenchim, Zanny Tanner, J Row 12, Yashi Chi, Yay Kunda, Your Mom, Winky Face, Zachary Lives, Zachary Zanasso, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zed Slayer Gamer, Zero Zala. Sylvan Ray, Nova, Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash